what does it mean? What, what, what are ways of quantifying couplings in a graph in general? Then there's a number of ways. For example, you may at the minimum ask for the graph to be connected. You may ask for um, the length of the longest path, the longest distance between the nodes on the graph. There is something called the resistance distance on a graph. Um, there is also very commonly used uh, the Fiedler algebraic connectivity is just the second smallest eigenvalue of the Laplacian of the graph. Uh, it's just a number, it's an eigenvalue which describes how connected is the graph. And so the objective of the talk is to try to bring some uh, rigor to the, to the idea that, uh, look, if you put it all together, there should be uh, a way of saying something like this. The power networks will synchronize when uh, there is large coupling in, the, in the, the transmission network connecting the generators. And so what I'll try to do today is I'll try to give you some uh, rigorous statements about these observations. Uh, by mean, I really mean giving you some tests for synchronization. They're going to be necessary and or sufficient conditions. So, and in sometimes there will be uh, no gap, but in other uh, cases there will be a gap between the necessary and the sufficient condition. And the sufficient condition for synchronizations are typically conservative. And so I'll also tell you about a sharp uh, condition, which, uh, which is a conjecture, which is guaranteed to be correct in some cases. And in other cases, we've just illustrated it by means of uh, simulation and Monte Carlo analysis. So that's the, that's the main message. And I hope it's clear right now so that, uh, that uh, later on you will, will follow me as I run through my, my 412, oh no, sorry, my 40 slides. Let me uh, take that idea and make it even a little bit more, more accurate. And um, I was talking about the coupling that has to be strong and larger than something. And that something is the non-uniformity in the network. And so let me uh, work th you through an example, just to kind of really make it concrete. So what you see up there is a graphical representation of a standard IEEE uh, test system. It's called the Reliability Test System 96. It consists of uh, 33 generators, which are described by the red squares. That's where power is uh, injected into the network. So the power is positive at those, at those locations. And then there are 40 load buses, which are described in this network by the uh, circular nodes. That's where power is, is consumed. So this is just a transmission network. It's a high voltage transmission network. At each of the load buses, there is a number of uh, distribution lines that uh, originate from there and bring the power to the users. Um, there's a 108 transmission lines in this particular test, but there is also an optional DC link, which I will neglect. So um, the way the network works uh, at a very, very high level simplified is the following. Uh, once an hour, um, an optimal power dispatch problem is solved, which means you have an estimate for what the users are going to need, and you match that estimate with the amount of power generated at all of your generators. So there really needs to be just a power balance in order for the frequency of the AC network to remain precisely equal to 60 hertz in the, U in the United States. But then, of course, during the hour, there are perturbations, right? It's not everything is going to work according and exactly according to plan. And so when there is a change in, uh, in um, uh, consumption, or perhaps maybe some of your generators are renewables and they themselves uh, don't provide the exact amount of power that you had expected, there are some mechanisms, there are some feedback rules that, that tell you, that, that decide how to change the amount of generation in the network in such a way that you maintain the power balance and you maintain the frequency of the network. So there are some rules for how these adjustments are generated. I'm going to make a very simplified assumption just to keep it extremely simple. I will, uh, will say, okay, I have the network, I have uh, found the parameters of the network online and I have computed the nominal operating condition. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to assume that all of the loads in this green area will uh, increase their demand for power by a small percentage. And then I will provide the additional power by the nodes generated, uh, sorry, contained in that blue uh, part of the network. And then basically power generated on the blue subgraph will have to cross, will be, have to be delivered through those two power lines to the green uh, subnetwork, right? And so 
What you can predict already now is that this particular perturbation is, is a kind of a, a, a difficult one to handle for the network. And there will be a point in, uh, as, I, as I keep increasing uh, the, the, request, uh, the power request on the bottom right, and I have to keep uh, correspondingly increasing the generation on the top left, at some point in time, something will happen which is undesirable. And so let me show you um, what happens. So. Um, here I'm increasing the loads by a small percentage, uh, only 2.6%. And it still remains true that the frequencies are equal to 60 Hertz. And it still remains true that all of the differences in phases between uh, uh, every single uh, uh, node of, on the network are less than pi over two. So I talk about phases because this is an AC network. At each location, uh, you're looking at your uh, uh, AC voltage and uh, you're just measuring its phase. So now, um, so there are many pictures here. The main two I want, to I want you to focus on is here, the maximum distance between. These are all the faces of all of the, um, um, how many did we say, 73 nodes are all being depicted here. Uh, and the maximum phase difference remains inside an interval of length pi over two. Now, um, I'm focusing on the pi over two phase difference, even though in, in, in reality, in practice, uh, I, there are some operational constraints that might uh, lead the, the precise number to be smaller than pi over two, but uh, just to keep it simple. Um, now, uh, the other picture I want you to focus on, it's here. This is a plot in which I am descripting all of the frequencies, and they are all written with respect to a rotating frame at 60 hertz. And so here, theta dot, so the uh, relative angular velocity is equal to zero. So every generator and every load bus is exactly running at 60 hertz. Everything is synchronous. The phase differences are being pushed to the limit, which is pi over two. So then now, as you keep increasing this uh, misbalance, um, as it turns out, um, after just another little bit, the phases will actually break out of the pi over two arc that was containing them. And this is a number that is becoming larger and larger. And the uh, frequencies will not remain at zero, but after some time they will just diverge. Now what is happening is that um, a large amount of power is being delivered through those two lines that I was describing here between the blue and the green line. And those two lines will for sure uh, uh, disconnect. And therefore, you have uh, obtained yourself a nice blackout in the green region because not enough power is available there. So what I would like to do is I would like to use this intuition about the coupling and the Kuramoto oscillators and the graph theory to be able to predict when at what precise values of that percentage. You write down a test which tells me, okay, I'm still stable up to this level, and after this level, I am going to become unstable, okay? And so I need to compare the coupling of the network with the amount of non-uniformity in power consumption and generation. So amount of non-uniformity in consumption and generation. So I'll, these are the two um, sets of words that I will be using uh, later on. Okay, so, so far I wanted to kind of really set it up quite slowly, and so let me now uh, speed up a little bit and uh, give you kind of like a standard introduction into the problems and so forth, the classic, uh, the classic type of talk that uh, you may be accustomed with. So there's a lot of interesting power systems, blackouts with a hundred years old system. Uh, in the United States, this has been the subject of a lot of attention. Um, there is uh, increasing adoption of renewables, which is adding stochasticity. There's a large number of distributed power sources that you want to integrate. And overall, what we're trying to do is add control sensing and optimization. We're trying to design a smart cyber physical layer on top of the power network. What we're trying to deal with is really the complexity of this large scale system, which has uh, you know, complicated dynamics at each node, complicated interconnections. Um, integration of control, sensing, communication, the physics itself is non-linear and so forth. Um, and so in my group, over the last couple of years, we've been working on, on uh, three projects. Uh, the one illustrated in this slide is the one I'll talk about today. Um, the second project that I, I just want to talk about for, for a minute uh, to give you an introduction, and perhaps I can follow up later on, um, is, is one on uh, cyber physical security. So we're considering the possibility of having um, 
attackers, so malicious agents that may compromise some of the um, uh, computers at your locations in the network, may those computers control um, sensors or actuators in the network, and um, this, such type of malicious attacks are, are potentially more dangerous than just your average uh, uh, faults and standard uh, changes that occur in the network uh, on, a daily, on a daily basis. Um, and so you, you have, if you, if you manage to compromise multiple locations on the network, here I'm illustrating this with a simple low dimensional model. This is a very simple three generator nine buses model of the Western United States. And in this very simple model, if you assume that you have uncorrupted sensors only at generator number one, and you assume that a malicious intruder has compromised your buses at locations four and five, then it is in fact possible for a malicious intruder to, to generate a disturbance in the network that grows unboundedly with time and it's unobserved at generator number one. The green line here is the output of your sensor at location one and you don't notice anything. So this is related to something in control theory referred to as zero dynamics and uh, we're interested in designing filters so detect the, for the to detect the presence of an intruder and to identify where the intruder is present. So um, there's a lot of interest in this. There's a lot of great work uh, here at KTH. There's a lot of uh, publicity due to the Stuxnet virus and due to other types of attacks that have occurred recently. So we're kind of we're kind of excited about that. Um, now, um, a third project we've been working on at UC Santa Barbara is in model reduction, and in particular using this concept called cron reduction. So Gabriel Cron uh, pioneered these methods for circuit analysis. Um, it's an interesting analysis, and this has to do with, uh, um, as, a, as I look at a network of size 10, 100, 1,000, I can perform computations in a really limited amount of times. But if I think about very massive, large-scale networks, then we're going to have to be able to perform some kind of model reduction. And so there's some beautiful scalability and algebraic graph theory that you can uh, study in the context of, of, of electrical circuits. So not just graphs, but graphs with uh, uh, weights uh, that are uh, admittances and that therefore have all the, you know, you can study all the electric problems. Okay, so this was my general introduction. So let me now, uh, maybe um, after the motivation, present you with some of the mathematical models. And so uh, this is yet another example. This is a very low dimensional representation of the New England power grid. You look at all the generators and you draw them as red squares and you look at all the um, load buses and you draw them as blue nodes. That's the, uh, once again, this is the transmission network. It's actually fairly well meshed. It's not a you know, like a, like a ring graph or, or a path or a chain graph. It's relatively well meshed. Um, and what's, of course, well known is that uh, for this graph, you, uh, there are, I'm going to use the N uh, being the number of generators and M being the number of load buses. And so you basically have an admittance matrix which describes the entire network. Uh, it's an N by M square complex valid matrix. And, and it's sparse in the sense that, well, it's relatively sparse in the sense that every time you don't see an edge in that graph, the corresponding entry of Y is zero. Um, and as I said, the central task of the network is each generator provides power, there needs to be power balance. You, you ask yourself the question about is the system acting in a synchronized, stable way despite the operational constraints and fluctuations in generation and demand. And so, okay, so what happens is, now let me talk about the dynamics of the network. So you have different equations that describe the behavior of either the generator or the load buses. And so at the generators, it's uh, standard to use the swing equation model, which is to say a second order uh, uh, integrator there. So I have a certain inertia of the generator, double acceleration, damping, and then on the right hand side I have the difference between the mechanical power that you put into the generator and the electrical power that is drawn out of the generator by the network. And now for the buses I'm going to use the PV model, which means uh, constant real power and linear frequency uh, dependence, which means that I have a first order differential equation. Um, once again, let me make it clear, I'm, I'm dealing with an AC network, I'm assuming the voltages to be constant, and so therefore um, you are only interested in the phase at each, at each node. And so the phase is described by an angle, here I have a single first order uh, damped integrator. Um, 
um, well, there is uh, the load, which is the amount of power drawn out of the load bus, and there is the, this is the amount of power that, that gets into the um, uh, node from the network. And so this amount of power here is very interesting. There is a quant maximal quantity, which is the product of the absolute value of the voltages uh, and the, uh, real, the, the magnitude of the admittance between node i and j. So this is a node i, and it's coupled to node j. If the entry is non-zero, then you will see an amount of power coming into this node which is proportional to the sign of those of that phase difference. Okay, so there are signs of angle different angular differences that appear in there. And so when you put it all together, um, you end up with the uh, interconnected swing equation model, which is uh, uh, known, well known in the literature. And it ends up being a combination of second and first order differential equations, each of which is about an angle. So in a way, all of these angles are rotating. These are all oscillators, as I was describing earlier. And so you have first order, second order. Then you have, I'm going to just call PI, the, the, the power um, either injected or uh, subtracted at node I. Here it can be positive or negative, as in this equation. And then I will abbreviate this, this product of terms that I had also in the previous slide with, uh, with the symbol AIJ. So that's the maximum amount of power that, that can be transferred between node I and J. Um, now, this is the model. Uh, that's the model, that's right, that I will use. The first N are the generators, the second M are the um, load buses. Now, what you want to do, you want to guarantee that the network continues to operate at constant frequency and with a relatively small differences in all, of the, uh, in all of the phases, right? That's the synchronization problem in the context of power networks. So that's written in the first line up there. And so this problem is related to a lot of classic work, which uh, I just mentioned right now, and that has to do in particular with the analysis of transient stability. You try to write a Hamiltonian descriptions of your, of your network, and you look at energy methods to identify the region of attraction of, of your equilibria. And in particular, uh, most of the successful algorithms in this area are, are numerical. And it's also related to something called uh, security analysis. Uh, this is an unfortunate coincidence of language. The word security here doesn't have anything to do with the cyber physical security I was talking about earlier. And the security question is really about, can I find an operating condition in, uh, in which the network will, will remain synchronous? That, that's actually closely related to the problem that I will consider right now. So there is a, a lot of uh, interesting literature that's related, but I won't talk about uh, all of that in great detail. But I will mention that um, in, in a number of works by uh, 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 power system scientists, uh, uh, and here I'm citing this paper by Maria Illich, uh, David Hill, and Juan Ron Chen, there is a, a recognition of the interest in trying to relate uh, various power system problems such as transient stability, security, as I described there, performance, robustness, and so forth, um, to the graph theoretical properties of the, of the power network or the electrical circuit describing the power network. And so when I talk about graph theoretical properties, let me not go into great details, but I'm talking about the topology of the network and the various algebraic uh, properties such as, you know, I was talking about the lambda 2 eigenvalue, I was talking about uh, resistance distance and so forth. So what can I use my understanding of the graph uh, to infer properties of the underlying network? Uh, and I want to do this, but I don't want to do this at the superficial level. I want to use a relatively accurate model of what the dynamical uh, network is actually doing. All right. So in order to do this, I am going to draw this connection I hinted at with the theory of Kuramoto oscillators. This is a beautiful theory that has uh, um, sprung out of, uh, of a centuries-old uh, uh, interest in coupled oscillators, beginning with the classic work by Huygens on, on coupled pendula and going on with beautiful work by Winfrey and Kuramoto on, uh, on uh, you know, canonical coupled oscillator models, leading up to the proposal of, of this model in the literature as being a very classic model of oscillators. Uh, it looks really very close to what I had earlier. This is first order model. There are just n oscillators. Um, the oscillators are different in that each of them has a natural frequency, omega i, and the, the frequencies don't need to be all identical. They are coupled through the sinusoidal coupling. That's a um, classic uh, way of, of interesting type of couplings. And uh, oftentimes, it's assumed that the amount of coupling AIJ is, is always positive and all identical, and it's normalized to k over n. And so usually, in Kuramoto oscillators, people are interested in looking at k as the strength of the coupling. And then you have all of the omegas 
omega 1 through omega n as uh, giving, you, giving rise to the non-uniformity that I was talking about earlier. So n oscillators, the non-identical frequencies, and I am interested in general case of coupling uh, with arbitrary strength Aij. Uh, now, if there is no edge between i and j, that number may be zero. Uh, if there is an edge, I will assume that the coupling is symmetric for today. And so there is also a beautiful mechanical analog. Um, I will not talk about it in great detail. And so Kuramoto oscillators are a really uh, uh, beautiful model that has been used in, in uh, all walks of life, in uh, a number of uh, scientific disciplines, um, in, in engineering, in physics, in biology. Uh, I, I shall not mention uh, the beautiful surveys available. And even uh, they've been publicized uh, uh, for, for broad audience uh, in the very successful and spectacular work by Stephen Strogatz. So that's a, a nice book I, I would suggest for everybody to read. So there's a beautiful literature on, on Kuramoto oscillators that you can, you can um, exploit, you can you know, bring to bear. Um, and so let me, as I continue to set the problem up, let me talk a little bit about synchronization. So um, you may be interested, uh, I have three notions which are increasingly more uh, demanding on the system. You may ask for all of the phases to be within an arc of length gamma. So here I have a little picture one, which means there is an arc on the uh, circle, so they're all oscillating, right? There's an arc of length gamma, so the arc does not need to be stationary, it could be rotating, it will be rotating in general, but I want to I wanna call my phases to be cohesive with the length gamma, and I want the length to be always less than pi over, at most pi over 2. If all of the oscillators are inside an arc, and this arc is rotating, if there exists an arc containing all the oscillators, um, uh, moreover, I may ask uh, uh, for the uh, system to be frequency synchronized. By that I mean to say that the oscillators are all rotating at the same frequency, at the same angular velocity. And finally, I could ask for phase synchronization, which means that literally all of the oscillators are exactly at the same angle. That's too strong a requirement. It's not even of uh, interest in the power systems area, but it's possible. And so the classic um, intuition, all the way back to the work by Huygens, is the following. I have uh, a source of coupling and a source of non-uniformity. Here in this, in this model up there, I'm using all the parameters a, i, j. Let, let me simplify for a second. Let's assume it's a homogeneous case where I just have k. So k is the strength of coupling, and then I have all of this diversity in the frequencies. And so the classic intuition is that if the coupling is very weak and the oscillators are very different from one another, the frequencies are very different, then the system will not synchronize. But if you design your mechanical pendula to, to oscillate at pretty much the same frequency with a very small variations, then even a little bit of coupling, uh, as Huygens discovered through the walls and the ceilings and the floor of your room, will lead to synchronization. Okay? So it's a trade-off between how different versus how coupled. And so this should be brought together in some kind of tests. And there is beautiful literature, once again, I will not have a chance to review it, that, that defines proper notions of synchronization, not necessarily the three I presented here. There's the notion of order parameters and beautiful other concepts. Um, what's, how do you define the coupling? What's the right coupling to look at? If it's just a scalar number k, that's easy, but if I have an arbitrary graph with weights, that's a different question. And, and then also, you know, uh, there's going to be phase transitions because we decided there are two regimes. So, you know, what does it happen? How does the system transition from one synchronized to another asynchronous state? Okay. All right. So, uh, let me summarize what I've talked about so far, which is I've described the network uh, model for my power system, uh, which is uh, comprised of both second and first order with forcing terms which are the injected and powers. Let's just, let's just call them injected. It could be positive or negative. Um, and that's up there with the PIs. And the coupling being sinusoidal on the differences in phases and with an arbitrary AIJ there. And actually then I presented the model which is very similar uh, on, on its face, which has the same type of coupling. Uh, and in, uh, here, I usually had omega i here, I'm writing pi, it's okay. So for the rest of the talk, whether I write omega i or pi, it is going to be the same. I mean to say the forcing on the right-hand side. Uh, 
This is, this is easy to see. It's a gradient term. There is a potential energy that describes this term. And this is a forcing term. So it's a forced gradient uh, system, if you want to think of Kuramoto systems that way. And so I'd like to look at the uh, synchronization theory for this uh, both second and first order or combination of second and first order oscillators. And so the first thing I should do is I should tell you why can I just, so what I would like to do, I would like to look at just the first order system. I, I don't want to be too concerned with the second order for today. And so let me give you one reason why looking at first order is reasonable as opposed to having to look at the whole second order model. And so I'll do that first before I get into synchronization theory. So these are the two models once again. Uh, oops, sorry. So here's what I'm going to do. So first of all, this has dimension n plus m. There are n plus m, but then there is also an additional n second, sec, second order equations, right? So literally, if I want to write it as a whole set of first order equation, the power system model is, is 2n plus m, because m are first order, n are second orders. If I want to, want, if I want to write the second order equations as first order, really it's a ordinary differential equations in 2n plus m, if you want to think of, about it that way. So here, um, I have only n plus m. So I, I want to establish an equivalence between the two, but dimensionally, I'm not perfect. And so what you do is, well, OK. So first of all, let me introduce some energy function, uh, which is the energy that describes the behavior of the, of the power system. There's a kinetic energy, and there is also this uh, energy uh, 1 minus the cosine, which gives rise to those sinusoidal coupling terms. With that energy function, it is possible to rewrite the power network as a, as a system which is, has some forcing, which are the, the, potent, the, the injected powers. And then on the right hand side, it has a, a Hamiltonian dynamics with some dissipative terms as well. And also some gradient terms, because the first order part are directly gradient terms. And then I take the um, Kuramoto model. And I write the, all of the first order equation as forced gradients, uh, which is already basically before. But then I also add an additional n equation of second order, which basically just describes some stable integrators, exponentially stable integrators. So by doing so, I have done two things. I, I now have two systems of the same dimension. And I have emphasized the, the structure of being forced gradient and Hamiltonian terms. And it turns out that what I will do now, I will construct a homotopy that brings the right-hand side of this system to be identical to the right-hand side of that system. Um, and so I'll call this system one, I'll call this system two. And so what I'll do, I'll, I'll introduce a convex parameter lambda between zero and one, and I will compute, I uh, will write the right-hand side as one minus lambda, the first right-hand side, plus lambda, the second right-hand side. And so now I have a dynamical system which depends upon a parameter lambda. When lambda is zero, I recover one system. When lambda is one, I recover the other system. And then you can do a little analysis to show that independent of lambda, that system has the same equilibrium. In other words, if you have an equilibrium of the first system, it's an equilibrium of the second system and all of the interpolating systems in between. And the Jacobian at that equilibria um, has the same inertia what that means, I have a matrix, I have a matrix, and um, it's the symmetric matrix, and the number of positive, negative, and zero eigenvalues does not change, is an invariant, okay? And so by, by doing so, let me skip ahead without reading everything, what I show is that the two dynamics are uh, topologically equivalent. They have the same equilibria, the equilibria are of the same type, and locally, only locally, I can take, here on the left, I have trajectories of the power system. This is an underdamped power system, so you see some oscillations. And on the right, I have the trajectory of the first order Kuramoto oscillator. And there exists a homotopy, so it's a, a continuous transformation of the trajectories of one into the other. Okay? So there is really some deep connection between the two. And, and for today, I'm going to focus just on existence and, and stability type of the equilibria. Okay? There is an interesting story about damping and, and, uh, and so forth, but I'll, and regions of attraction, but I will skip it. So there's some comments already. This result is, is uh, uh, not so clearly and understood in the literature, so I'll, I'll skip it unless some of you are interested in it later on. OK, so now that I have established uh, this e topological equivalence between the two models, this equivalence of equilibria and stability type, I'm just going to look at the first order model. And then I, once I have the results for the first order model, I'll bring that up to results for the second order model, which is the power system, or the multi-rate model, which is the power system. OK, so here's the first result. And um, 
It's a uh, simplified case in which I uh, assume that the graph is all to all and it's homogeneous. And so I therefore recover the classic Kuramoto model in which there is a single coupling constant which is normalized to be k over n. All right. So for this case, we have a fairly sharp characterization which goes like this. It says that um, I, let me read, the, the two conditions here are equivalent. So the Kuramoto model will achieve phase cohesiveness and frequency synchronization. And not on, I don't mean to say a specific model, I mean to say all models with frequency omega 1, uh, omega n, taking value in a compact set. So suppose I have a compact set and I'm interested in achieving synchronization for all possible Kuramoto models in that, uh, with frequencies with non-uniformity taking value in that compact set. So I will achieve that if and only if the coupling uh, k is larger than a critical value of the coupling and that, that I'll call critical coupling, okay, k subcritical, and that's just equal to the maximum difference k max minus k, uh, omega max minus omega mean. So you look at the fastest oscillator, the slowest oscillator, the difference between the two is a positive number. Of course, you need the coupling to be larger than that. It's a very simple condition. It has precisely the right, the right structure that I talked about in slide number two today, which is that I want the coupling to overcome the non-uniformity. And in this case of all-to-all -all graph with homogeneous coupling, it's very easy to see. And it's, it's, it's actually a sharp condition in the sense that, that that's an if and only if characterization. Okay? Not only that, also um, um, using a little bit, you know, in control theory there's this notion of practical stability. You have a, you have a, a desired equilibria. Perhaps not all trajectories go exactly to the equilibria, but there is a, a, a big region such that everything that starts in the big region will converge to a small region near the equilibria. And so, in fact, this property is exactly true for that Kuramoto oscillator. What happens is that there's a little bit of trigonometry here. You compute two particular arc lengths, gamma min, gamma max, such that your, your um, all trajectory starting inside an arc of length gamma max uh, will shrink to uh, uh, arcs of length gamma min. So you are phase cohesive at any gamma inside there, and on top of that you're contracting down to an arc of length gamma min. And uh, you, once you start inside gamma max, all trajectories will achieve exponentially fast frequency synchronization. So the omega dots are going to, uh, the, the theta dots are going to become equal exponentially fast, and you're going to, you, you can predict uh, the region of attraction for that particular uh, frequency synchronization. Um, so this test is interesting, and there's beautiful connection. It improves certain results in the literature, and it uh, it recovers other results in the continuum limit, which was studied in some of the physics literature. Now, this is great, uh, but that's not what I really wanted. I wanted to do that analysis for arbitrary graphs. Actually, I didn't mean completely arbitrary graphs. I meant to say I'm working with undirected graphs, so aij is equal to aji. Um, and I want them to be connected. That's a minimum, otherwise I know it's for sure this is not going to work. Uh, the other thing I'm going to assume about this model for a second, it makes sense to do so, is that the average of the frequency is zero. If that's not true, you just, it's a, without loss of generality, you just rescale the angular velocity and you move it yourself in a rotating reference frame. So that's not a big deal. So for arbitrary weights, we do have a necessary condition and sufficient condition, but they are not equivalent and there is a gap between them. And so let me just focus on the sufficient, which is the one that I'm most interested in. The sufficient requires that lambda 2, that number I was talking about earlier, which describes the coupling in the network, I'll talk about it more in the next slide, is larger than the non-uniformity in the frequencies. But this time, I am not looking at the largest non-uniformity omega i minus omega j. So that, in the previous slide, I used omega max minus omega min. That's like the infinity norm of the vector of angular frequencies. It's the largest number. Here, instead, I have to use a two norm. So this is uh, based on a two, uh, on a quadratic analysis, whereas before, I was using a kind of like a, an infinity uh, Lyapunov function. So that, that's, that test, as again the right structure on, on the left hand side I have the measure of coupling which has to overcome a measure of non-uniformity so it has the right structure and also this lambda 2 is beautiful it's a, a very well studied quantity there's a lot of understanding about that uh, this is the right implication the right structure we have some equivalent formulation that use the resistance distance but before I continue let me remind you a little bit about some graph theory 
just for the ones of you who are not familiar. So what is that lambda 2? Um, and so that's, so let me just quickly review. So I have a graph, I have a set of edges, script E, they have some weights. I can define the adjacency matrix. I can define the degree matrix, which is just the sum of the in or out degrees at each node. There is also a way if you arbitrarily assign orientations to the edges of the graph, you can define the incidence matrix. This is, this is called algebraic graph theory with a capital T, but it is really not scary in the sense that it's just a couple of very basic definitions and a, and a couple of very simple theorems. So please don't be concerned, but it's really useful tools in this type of analysis. And so two slides ago, I had an infinity test, which was of this form. I had the incidence matrix multiplied by a vector of quantities, each of which is associated to a node of the network. And so if you, if you do the infinity norm of this vector operation, you get the maximum of the pairwise xi minus xj. OK, that's one, one result. Um, Another thing you can do, you can define using those matrices up there, you can define the Laplacian matrix, which, uh, which is defined in various ways in the literature, for example, the adjacency matrix minus the degree matrix. Alternatively, once you have an ordering in the, in the edges, you can multiply the incidence matrix by a diagonal matrix containing all of the weights associated to each of the uh, edges, and then B transpose. These two equations are, these two formulations are equivalent, and you get a matrix which is positive semi definite. Um, and so, I think I have a sign wrong there. Forgive me. Anyway, uh, you get a Laplacian matrix, which is, uh, I think I should have had D minus A here. Forgive me, it's, it's, it's positive semi-definite. And so now it has, therefore, eigenvalues, which are all zeros or positive. The um, rank of that matrix is at most n minus 1, because at least one eigenvalue is known to be identical to 0. Uh, and that's the eigenvalue corresponding to a vector equal to all 1s. And um, if you have a connected graph, therefore the second eigenvalue is strictly positive, then the smallest eigenvalue, the lambda 2, is uh, called the Fiedler eigenvalue or the algebraic connectivity of the graph, and it gives a measure of how connected is the graph. And so that's the standard algebraic graph theory, uh, which I am using here to describe the coupling overcoming the non-uniformity. Okay? So somehow I've had success so far, so let me translate these results to the power network uh, arena. Um, and so uh, let me skip this first result for phase synchronization, which is uh, too strong and not of great interest. If I had a transmission network that has all the AIJs equal to each other, so remember I said that the transmission network was really fairly well meshed, which means that potentially this is a strong assumption, not realistic, but not completely out of the ballpark. Um, then, if all AIJs are equal to a constant, then I have a test which is fairly sharp, and it tells me that that quantity decoupling has to be greater than the maximum difference between the power injections. Remember, some of those P are positive and some are negative. And so, for power networks, I have exactly the right statement, which is the coupling. These are admittances. So the admittance in the network somehow has to dominate the imbalances in the active power. So the, the PI, the injected power uh, in power systems language, that's the active power, not the not reactive power. Now, if instead I really need to go for the uh, uh, full model with the arbitrary weights on the edges, then I have this lambda 2 greater than that. That is my sufficient condition. And the coupling here now has this more uh, abstract interpretation of rather than being the admittance of each line, is just the lambda 2, the algebraic connectivity of the, of the circuit understood as a, as a, as a graph. Now, I could at this time um, proclaim full theoretical victory over the problem if for the pesky little detail that my test here is a little bit conservative. In other words, there is a gap between the necessary and the sufficient condition, which I did not have for the homogeneous case. So um, in the remainder um, of the talk, I'd like to um, give you some insight into five minutes. I'd like to give you insights into um, a different test, which is sharper, but for which we don't have a complete uh, set of uh, results. But it's kind of exciting new work, so I could not resist. Uh, but my student Florian and I could not resist from talking about it. Um, and so let me tell you why that test is conservative. So there are two uh, various aspects. One is, you see, I am asking for for phase cohesiveness. I'm asking for all of the uh, phases to be in a small arc. Now, 
That's too strong a requirement because imagine, for example, that I had a graph which was a chain or a path graph, which means that you have n nodes and they're all connected just linearly. And so now I'm asking for the first phase to be really close to the last phase, which means that everything needs to be really, really small and tight. And so I'm really kind of asking for too much. Um, um, All-to-all -all cohesiveness is too strong a requirement. And then also because of that, and also because of my limited mathematical capacities, the only analysis I've been able to complete is using two norms, which end up being conservative. It's the two norm that leads to the lambda two measure, by the way, but it's conservative. And then the reason why the analysis is conservative, simply speaking, is that if you just look at the scalability of the right-hand side, it's really not very friendly. So if you have n random numbers between zero and one, the two norm of that is of order n, whereas in, instead, if I were able to use the infinity norm of the pairwise differences, I would have something of order one, right? So that's, that's undesirable. So the scalability is not quite right, it's not quite completely right. So um, let me instead take a little detour, kind of get you interested in the problem. There's some beautiful graph theory here that comes into place. So suppose I take a slightly different approach. Instead of talking about arcs and lengths of arcs and trying to show that they're invariant under the dynamics, let me just make the observation that if I take the right-hand side and I compute its Jacobian, so, you know, classic set of differential equations, you get an n by n matrix, right? It turns out that that particular matrix is equal to minus the Laplacian of a graph. And that graph has the same edges as the original graph. And the weights on the edges are the old weights, Aij, multiplied by the cosine of the phase differences. And so I computed Jacobian at an equilibrium. And so I, I use the superstar to denote I'm at an equilibrium. I want to compute the Jacobian, verify if the equilibrium is stable. Now, if um, if it turns out that all of these pairwise differences are less than pi over 2, so therefore all those angles are less than pi over 2, therefore those cosines are all positive, then I still have a graph with positive weights. That's important because algebraic graph theory does not quite work with negative weights. There's a lot fewer results available and less understood. So you usually assume that the weights are positive. In this case, you get positivity if the, the, the phase differences are less than pi over 2, uh, but notice that that only has to be true for those cosines that appear in the right-hand side. So therefore, okay, here I'm using some mathematical language to say that the only theta i minus theta j that are required being small are the ones that are in the edges of the graph. So, so in my example, if I, had a chain, if I had a chain graph, I'm only asking for the phase differences pairwise, not from first to last. Okay, so it's a weaker, it's a much weaker requirement. And so I know that if I am inside that set, uh, let me call it delta, in which uh, these, uh, these phases are less than pi over 2, then all I need to do in order to get local exponential stability, which also implies frequency synchronization, um, um, is I need to um, just find an equilibrium. Find an equilibrium. Very simple to say. Um, and a little bit hard to do. Find an equilibrium means you just need to solve the equality between the non-uniformities on the left-hand side, omega i's, equal to the right-hand side. Find the set of phases for all the generators and all the load buses. Sorry, I'm using the power system language. For all the Kuramoto angles, such that you, you equate power, uh, um, angular frequencies, natural frequencies of the oscillators with the phase differences. So. This is a set of n equations that you want to solve. There's a bunch of parameters. The a, i, j's are parameters. The omega, i's are parameters. And you want to find a solution in a certain set. It turns out to be non-trivial, non-trivial. And in this slide, I have a solution that is correct under some assumptions. And we have, we have some uh, uh, verified that the statement is correct. Uh, under either one of those three assumptions. Assumption number one is that the graph is a tree, or it's a homogeneous graph, all to all, or it's a graph that contains short cycles of length up to four, and the cycles have to be decoupled. So I may have, a, you may have, have cycles, but they cannot be sharing edges. And so strictly speaking, this test that I have here, which I'll comment on in a second, is correct under either one of those assumptions, okay? And so, uh, here I have a test in which I have, in one single number, both the non-uniformity, these are all the omegas, uh, and the coupling. So let me just remind you, the infinity norm of B transpose of a vector was the maximum uh, component-wise difference, right? 
That was the maximum component-wise difference. Here, the, the omegas are, are being scaled by the pseudo-inverse of the uh, Laplacian of the graph, so of the admittance matrix of the circuit. So in other words, if I have large admittances, so if the network is well coupled, then as I do the pseudo-inverse, I get, uh, I get uh, that the L pseudo-inverse omega is small, right? So the two quantities are being multiplied together in a single expression. And the test is that this quantity has to be less than one. So it's a very simple test, very simple test. Um, if that test is true, then I can find a solution and I can be, frequent, I can be locally, uh, have all the right properties that I want. Now, this test is only sufficient um, and we can only prove it for some graphs, but we have tested it on a, we have, we have experimented with it on a number of uh, uh, sample systems and we were very happy with the result. It appears to be very accurate, even though a complete theoretical analysis is not yet complete. So, um, let me go back to finish my talk, I'm out of time, uh, and tell you that this new test is in fact uh, very predictive of that instability that I showed uh, early on, 45 minutes ago. Uh, once again, this is the RTS sample system 96, same exact slide as before. I do the increasing generation and the increasing loads, so I'm changing the non-uniformity of the graph. And, and it turns out that this is the first slide where I had increased the load by 2.59%, and that quantity is to be is a precisely equal to 0.99995. And then if I increase the load by another 0.1%, I just cross precisely that threshold uh, and I get to just slightly above one. And in fact, uh, simulations illustrate the instability. So that graph uh, definitely has a lot of cycles and it's, it's, uh, we're using realistic numbers that we found from the literature. So we are very optimistic, even though, uh, as I was mentioning, some of the theory is, uh, uh, is yet to be discovered. Um, and with this, I'd like to conclude uh, and summarize. I have you know, some connections between uh, power systems at Kuramoto and some tests for synchronization. So thank you for your attention.